and on. You know, I'm, I'm genuinely burdened by the nations and what's happening here both in America. And we have to prepare. This, this is not a, a moment to shriek back in fear. But God has faith and strength for you today. Just reaching out to our intercessor team this morning. There is a spirit of discouragement that is coming against people. There's a spirit of despair. We know that many are in this crossroads where their jobs are at stake because of political beliefs or personal convictions. This is not a moment to stand in fear or shrink back in fear, but to stand in faith that God is able to overcome what the enemy's brought against you. And God's doing things in this house and across the nation. So we're in a series called Moving Forward, Where to Start When You're Stuck. And I'll be finishing a, just a brief view at the life of Gideon. Uh, we don't have a lot of time today. I'll do my best to see what we do. But let's go after some things today. So normally I love to sprinkle in some humor and some personal stories. We may not have a lot of time for that today. So we'll just go for the jugular. I learned it from my mentor, Francis, to uh, not back away, but to lean into the awkward and the pain. And so uh, we're excited for what God has today. Do me a favor, turn your Bible. Judges chapter 6. I'm going to give you a brief overview of Judges 6, and then we're going to pray. We know many family and guests are here today. We want to welcome those that are here to support Sean and Amy. But Judges chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 6. I'm going to skip to 11 and then 23. So Judges chapter 6, verse 6 says this. Thus Israel was greatly impoverished because of Midian. And the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Verse 11. And now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. After a unique exchange, Gideon brings a gift to this angel of the Lord, we find out, that is Yahweh, verse 23. And as he gives this sacrifice, this offering, fire is met there, and Gideon thinks he's going to die, verse 23. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you, do not fear, you shall not die. And then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. Yahweh is shalom. To this day, it still stands. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. The Lord is peace. The Lord is peace. Jesus, we thank you that you can give us a peace that surpasses understanding. God, we come against anxiety and fear in Jesus' name. And we declare that Yahweh is peace. That you will bring grace in this moment. As many are concerned about their future, you're not concerned about the future. You hold time and space, our past and our present and our future. And God, we trust you. And this morning, as we talk about areas of strongholds in our life, God, would you give power to overcome? Would you give authority, Jesus, to take back ground we've given to the enemy? God, we pray that you'd come against generational curses and lies that we believed, limiting beliefs. We pray that you'd open our heart and mind. Just do me a favor right now. Put your hand on your heart. Say, Holy Spirit, open my heart. Holy Spirit, heal my heart. Put your hand on your head. Come on, we're going to do this whole thing like kindergarten right now. Say, in the name of Jesus, mind be renewed, made new in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to the person next to you say, get ready. Get ready. All right. The year was 680, and Winfred was born to a very wealthy English family. His father was a nobleman, and so his dad expected him to follow in his footsteps. However, one day going to the Anglican church, as he's there, not Anglican church at that time, the Catholic church, as Winfred walks into the church, he receives this call from God. He says, I'm called to be a priest in the Lord's house. He goes home and tells his parents to his father's really disdain, he becomes a monk at a very young age. As he's serving in the local abbey, the person that mentored him dies, and everybody expected Winfred to take over this certain monk's place. He said, no, I'm called to reach the unreached. I'm called to go where the gospel has not yet gone. So he serves with another monk, and they go throughout the land of Frisia. As they're there, they have much success. They're seeing healings and signs and wonders take place. They get the attention of the Pope. The Pope calls Winfred forward and says, I've called you to be a missionary to Germania, which is Germany. And as you go there, I name you now Boniface after Boniface the Martyr. Quite a call and quite an intense job application, right? So he goes out to Germany, and as he's there, he surveys the land. He begins to preach and has very little success. Here's a picture of Boniface, one of the uh, old paintings they had of him. 
as Boniface is searching throughout the land, he recognizes that this city is steeped in pagan practices. And they worship this god named Donar, and they have the Donar oak. Here's a picture of what a sacred oak would look like. This is the angel oak. Just to give you an idea, this is what a sacred oak would look like. Now, Donar, we don't know that name. We're not familiar with it. But we would understand him to be the god known as Thor, believe it or not. So this is who they worship at this particular land. Not kidding you. Literally, it's called Thor's oak. So one night, after preaching all day with little success, people are getting stumbled by Liam Hemsworth. So let's go to, or Chris Hemsworth. Let's go and lower that. This is Chris. Get it right. Look at, listen, they know. <laughs> so one night after preaching the gospel with little success, he's in his house and he starts to hear incantations. And there's a ritual sacrifice taking place at Thor's oak. So as he's there, he's grieved. Now, Ephesians 6 says this. It says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil one. We know this verse. and We would look at this as metaphorical. Boniface took this literally and picked up his axe and charged towards the donor oak. As he carries his axe in the middle of this seance, he begins to strike the oak. Now, some people try to stop him and they say, listen, don't stand close to the oak because Thor will strike you dead with lightning. Well, as he begins to chop this oak, a gust of wind comes and the oak tree falls over, rendering Thor powerless. People are in awe. He stands on top of the oak, preaches the gospel. They all get saved. From there, they then to proceed to cut up the oak tree and they build his church with the wood. Boniface goes down as this legend that literally saved Germany. So anybody that's a believer in Germany comes from the influence of what Boniface did that day. You see, he recognized there was a stronghold in that city that needed to be broken. There was a stronghold in that city that needed to come down. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says this. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand for there and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. See, he understood that they were enslaved. They were, they were yoked by this God of fear. Now, again, we're so far removed in modern culture from the concept of an altar. So any other city in ancient time you would go to, there would be an altar at the center of the city in which you would glorify a deity or deities. Now, an altar requires two particular things. It has a sacrifice, but it requires someone's attention and affection. So an altar demands your attention, and it demands your heart. It demands your affection. Now, altar comes from this phrase in Latin called altus, which means a high or a lifted place. Now, luckily in America, we don't have any altars. Nothing at all. Nothing that demands our attention and affection. We'll save that for another time. But ultimately, whatever you give your attention and affection to become an authority in your life. Whatever you give your attention and affection to become an authority in your life. Now, in the American culture, we love to live in the illusion that things don't have power over us. We love to live in the illusion that we are our own independent people, and it's my choice and my way. Let me just break that open a little bit. How many of you have ever gone to a party Telling your spouse or committed to yourself that you will not eat something not on your diet. And then you walk to the altar of junk food. <laughs> you know exactly what I tell you. It calls you. It beckons you. Why is it so hard? Because it has an authority over you. Your body at the base level is calling to you because there's an authority that that altar has over you. I know that's a very graphic example, but that's exactly what it is. See, now authority, there's two types of authorities. There are authorities that empower you or enslave you. And an altar is that which you give attention and affection to. And ultimately, that becomes an authority in your life. And what we notice in the story of Israel is that they are oppressed by Midian. And they blame it on Midian, but ultimately, they are enslaved by idolatry. And this is why Yahweh has lifted his hand from them. In Judges chapter 6, they cry out for help. They're impoverished. 
means they're weak in spirit. They have nothing left. Have you ever noticed? It's often at the times when you have nothing left, you finally call out to God. Let it not be in the place of only desperation that we cry out to Jesus. But they cry out to Yahweh, and in return, he meets them, but he sends them a prophet. You see, they have this oppressor coming against them, and they want to get rid of the problem, but Yahweh wants to deal with their heart. Oftentimes, when you have things coming against your life, you have to ask the question, what do you need to make right in your life first before the problem goes away? And so Yahweh says, listen, I'm going re- to remove your oppressor. It's going to be in a way you don't expect. But number one, this prophet comes in and says, you have to remove the altars of Baal. You have to remove this idol worship that you've replaced in reverence of me. This is a big deal. Why? Because they were afraid. They believed that if they did not honor Baal, that rain would not come and their crops would not be blessed. They lived in a spirit of fear. They gave over that authority to this other God, believing that he was the one that would provide for them. So what happens? The the scene dramatically shifts, and we see the angel of the Lord visit an unlikely hero. Here's this young man in a wine press that is threshing wheat. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. Why is he threshing wheat in the wine press? Number one, he believes he has to hide his crops from Midian. He's very smart. But number two, it communicates this. He's threshing wheat in the wine press because there's no belief of future blessing or harvest. There's no belief for future wine coming to the house. And what the enemy wants you to do is he wants you to believe that there's no future harvest for your life. There's nothing to look forward to. And he's threshing wheat in this wine press. He has no hope. They don't expect that they have another crop or another season. And the angel of the Lord says, look at you, Gideon, mighty man of valor. He calls him a mighty hero of war. And here's the beautiful thing. Gideon hasn't won anything. He hasn't won one fight. He hasn't even stood up to anybody at his kindergarten or first grade class. He hasn't done anything. But we don't serve a God that's in the business of giving away participation trophies. See, when God sees us, he sees who we will be, not who we are. And we have to live in that position of knowing who God sees us and calls us to be, not how we presently feel. You get all up in your feelings all the time, church. I know. I do too. We have to break out of how we feel and position our heart to faith, knowing that Jesus has called us to something greater than presently is. And it's a greatness not defined by secular terms, but by spiritual terms. Remember, Joseph was successful in prison when he had no possessions to his name because he was seen by his father in heaven. That's what success is in a biblical context. So here's Gideon standing in this wine press. He calls him, doesn't know what to do, doesn't know who he's talking to. Yahweh himself is patient with him. And as he's patient, he goes back and he prepares this meal. Now he, when you read it, In the Hebrew, he prepares an elaborate feast, a feast for 10, 15 people. It's a dramatic thing he does. He comes back. He gives the food over on this this altar. He sets up this rock, and then fire comes, and the angel of the Lord disappears. He realizes that it's Yahweh. He thinks he's going to die, and it continues in verse 23. The Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. We prayed about this a minute ago. To this day, it still stands. Now, from the outside, again, we're so far removed from the context of an altar, we just think that Gideon's doing a ceremonial act. But one scholar really gives perspective at the, to the significance of what Gideon did. He says this, What Gideon has just done impulsively as his own personal response to Revelation he received, probably without realizing it, he has created a situation which cannot remain unresolved. He creates a situation that can't remain unresolved. For there are now two altars in Ophrah, two rival gods, his own God, Yahweh, and his father's God, Baal. So he builds this altar at the sacred oak that they would worship Baal at. An altar cannot be divided in the house. Uh, One house cannot have two altars. There's a rival God, and we have to all come to this moment of faith where we recognize, no matter what my family has worshipped, my worship is unto the Lord. No matter what my family has done, my worship must become my own. And now Gideon, in response, builds this altar, and now he's responsible for the altar he's built. Terrified, in bed that night, Yahweh speaks to him directly. 
This young boy that did not know the voice of God. And now he said this rude awakening. As he's in bed, he hears the voice and says, you must tear down your father's altar to Baal. It's a big call. You see, temple and altar are two dominant themes in the Old Testament. We find it everywhere. Now, when Jesus comes on the scene, we see a couple different things happen. He starts to refer to his ecclesia, his church, that he's calling out. But he also says some other strange language. He calls them a body. He calls them a bride. But he also refers to himself as a temple. And so when he does this, he says, behold, I'm going to create a temple that's better or greater than the temple that you see. Tear it down or rebuild it in three days. Now, we know this is spiritual language, but what Paul does is he takes it one step further. That now as Jesus' ecclesia, as his body and his bride, we are now Jesus' temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says this. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Temple language. Now we're talking about Gideon. He builds this altar. He now dedicates it to Yahweh. We have the same concept for us. And here's what we have to ask the question. If we are temples, every temple requires an altar. What's the altar of us? The altar of everyone here is your heart. And when Jesus gives this command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then to love your neighbor as yourself, that's the sacrifice. This is not physiological language. It's not biology. He's not giving a biology lesson. We think of your heart being your physical organ. What he actually is communicating is temple language. Because the Jews understood that your heart was the altar of your life. The heart, the cardia, literally means the center of one's life, the seat of your affection. So when you give your life to Jesus, now as a temple, you have this altar called your heart, the physical center of your life, and there is competition as to who gets to sit on that throne. There's a fight and a war to who gets to sit on that throne. And the moment you receive Jesus, you build an altar of your heart unto him. And now the mission is to tear down all the other altars that own your life, your attention, and your affection. So just like Gideon, you're watching the story, he builds an altar. We all do this, not knowing the significance of what we do when we call Jesus Lord. And now we have to start dealing with the problems of the other idols of our heart. But the issue is in modern church culture is we think the other idols can get along with our worship of Jesus. Those idols don't play well together. See, and what happened here and what we learn is that Joash, Gideon's dad, has this altar to Baal and this altar to Asherah. Here's a picture of what Baal and Asherah would look like. They would sacrifice their children. They would do lots of demonic acts to Baal. Here's Asherah, which is the female counterpart. Here's something interesting that I found out about Asherah. They believed, as these cultic practices morphed, they incorporated Asherah in their worship of Yahweh because they believed that she was a conduit of Yahweh's blessing. So here's Joash communicating these false beliefs that you can have a relationship with Yahweh and the other cultic gods of the other tribes that surrounded them. Those two don't mix. And there's something we're facing in modern Christianity where we become so culturally relevant, we have a holy secularism. And we have this secular idea. See, there's no holy secularism. There's only a Holy Spirit. And that's where we're called to live from, that there cannot be an enmeshment. You cannot live with both God and culture. We are called to change culture, be countercultural. And when Yahweh's the authority in your life, when Jesus is the authority in your life, there we go. It demands that every altar must fall as well. Every idol. So he's the one dictating your time, your attention, and your affection. That's where Jesus comes from. That's what he has to be positioned in. So now here's Gideon faced in this literal rock in a hard place, not knowing what to do. He has to tear down his father's altar. Not only that, he has to take a bull and sacrifice it on the altar. It's a direct insult to Baal. Baal is the bull god. And he says, I want you to sacrifice a bull on Baal's altar. That's a big deal. But here's what's so cool about this. Verse 26, he says, and I want you to build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold. 
Underline that, circle it, whatever you want to do in your Bible on your phone. I want you to build an altar on the stronghold. See, the reason many of us can't get free from strongholds and addictions in our life is we think we could do it peripherally or we think we could do that on its own, but we have to invite the authority of Jesus in the strong man. You have to invite the authority of Jesus on the stronghold. And he breaks the stronghold. He says, I want you to come and establish a new altar. Now, when you come in here, this is the illusion that you have to clean up your life immediately when you turn over to Jesus. No, it is a journey, folks. It is a process. We are the church of the messed up people. Let me just tell you that. The one time you think that these pastors have it to get it together, just call Francis. He'll tell you we don't. We are hot messes, friends, but we serve a God that makes miracles out of those messes. And from that place, he starts to bring transformation within us. But here's what we have to do. How do you get free from a stronghold? Here's three practical tips because I rarely am practical, but my friend said I had to be today. So here's the three practical tips. In order to overcome a stronghold, number one, you have to identify what the stronghold is. Identify what's that area of addiction? What's that altar in your life? Is it anxiety? Is it fear? Is it pornography and lust? Is it adultery? Is it a generational curse? Is it food? Identify the altar. Number two, you have to investigate why it's there. And you invite the Lord into that process. You say, okay, I know what the, I, what the stronghold is. That's not enough just to know what it is. That's a big starting place. But why is it there? Why has it been given authority in your life? Why has it taken root? Why has it started to settle in? And from there, you do what Gideon does next. You have to invite others in the process. So Gideon recognizing that he can't do this on his own. He does not have the strength to overcome himself. What does he do? He goes and finds 10 friends. You cannot overcome addiction and strongholds in your life on your own. Freedom requires community. Freedom requires people around you. Mark, was that a good plug for community? That's why we are passionate about Acts, Acts 2 communities in our church. You require, thank you, Mark. You require people in your life to overcome that which owns you. It requires others to be in that journey. So many people try to do their faith on their own. It doesn't work that way. Where you're like, well, Jesus was in the wilderness by himself. It was Jesus in the wilderness. You can't do this on your own. He always sends them two by two. He always sends them with community because why? We have a triune God that is a communal God and now he requires that of us. You be in fellowship with his spirit, with him, with others. And he invites them in and they tear down this stronghold. And the next morning, people wake up. What does this communicate? Number one, they recognize every day they worship Baal. The only reason why they notice the stronghold is down is because they made it a regular practice. And they notice the fires coming from this altar and they go there and they say, Joash's son, Gideon did this. They know. Why do they know this? Because one of his friends ratted him out. You have to always test who those friends are. There's always a Judas in the crew, right? So they rat him out and he's there, but they call, they don't call Gideon out. They call out Joash. Why? Because he's the elder of the town. He's the keeper of the altar. They say, Joash, your son must die. He destroyed the altar of Baal. Your son must die. You see, here's what we have to understand. Is Gideon didn't just crash his dad's Ferrari. This was a big, he destroyed the altar of the town. He took down one of the most significant places. And now... It was guaranteed that he was disavowed his inheritance. He'd be removed from the house, but now they're requiring his life. They're requiring a sacrifice. That's why he has to die. They're afraid Baal's going to curse their land. And here's Joash. He's stuck between the townspeople and his family, but most importantly, he's stuck between Baal and Yahweh. And as he's between these two in the valley of decision, he says, if anybody touches my son, they're going to die. 
Behold, let Baal contend for himself. See, there's a moment when a father or a mother needs to stand in the gap for their children. No matter what mistakes they've made, no matter what regrets they carry, there is a moment where you say, not in my house. And they stand in the gap and he says, no, my son's life is in his own hands and most importantly, Yahweh's hands. He steps up as a spiritual leader in his house. We're gonna make this about gender. Men, step up as the spiritual leaders in your house. Make this place a rightful house that serves and honors the Lord. My house will honor the Lord. No matter the cost at times, no matter the pain, doesn't mean you're arrogant, doesn't mean you're a jerk, but you stand in faithful humility as leaders in your house. He takes authority. Single moms, take authority over your house. No matter how much your ex has messed things up, take authority in your house. Don't stray from the Lord. And he says, I'm gonna stand for my house. And they rename him Jerubbabel. Odd name to be named. It means this. Let Baal contend against himself. So here's what's so cool about this. He calls him Gideon, mighty man of valor. And within 24 hours, he takes down the stronghold of his land. What did he win? He won the spiritual inheritance of his family and his community. And he fights this battle. And here's the beautiful thing. He's now no longer known as Gideon. He's known as Jerubbabel. And everywhere he goes, this is what one scholar says so brilliantly, it reminds people of Baal's impotence. Every day he's alive reminds them that Baal is powerless. Every day you're alive and you own the testimony in the place you took authority through Jesus, you become a living, breathing testimony of the authority of Jesus to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his saints. You become a testimony of freedom, of drug addiction, of alcoholism, of pornography. You become a freedom source for others. That you, like Boniface, can set others free, for Christ has set you free. Do not yet again live under a yoke of slavery. You now become the living testimony of that. You become a Jerubbabel. This is the call. Today you may be in multiple places. You may have altars in your heart that need to be identified. You may never have given your life to Jesus. This is the moment to say, not in my house. Fathers and mothers, you need to stand up for your kids and fight for your kids as they're in the fight of their life right now. I want to invite us to stand together as we just pray today. Prayer team, can come forward. Pastor Francis and Susie, I want you guys to come up. Spiritual moms and dads here. Just stand together with eyes closed. You're going to come up stage. Come on, you're, it's, it's a special day for me. I don't miss this day. I want them to stand up here as moms and dads in the house. We're going to pray for those that need to really see breakthrough in their families. But just with eyes closed, you're here today and you say, you know what? I need to recommit the altar of my heart to Jesus. I need to stand in faith and confidence and make Jesus number one. No longer will I give my attention and affection to other things. Eyes closed, if that's you, just lift your hand up right now. Father, we declare in Jesus' name, absolute resilient commitment to you which is secure undivided devotion to Jesus secondly today you say there's altars in your heart of addiction that need to be broken there's altars of anxiety or fear and you say you know what I need Jesus to take authority in an area of my life lift your hand up if that's you Father we break every generational curse and addiction in Jesus name we say no longer will it have power no longer will it have authority in my life but Jesus you reign supreme you are the supreme authority in their life today Today. We want to pray for spiritual moms and dads right now where you're in a place where you need breakthrough in your family. I'm going to have Francis and Susie pray. You need breakthrough in your family in a significant way. Lift your hand up if that's you. Have Francis pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're here to help, Lord. You're a very present help in times of trouble, God. You know our needs before we ask, when we humble ourselves and say, I need you. Father, today we humble ourselves and acknowledge we need you, God. You said he whom the Son sets free is free indeed, Lord. So we invite you to set us free. Lord, you've shined light in our darkness, Lord. We don't want to run away from you. We want to run to you, Lord. Gideon was a man who finally stepped up. 
Lord, I pray for men and women in this room, they would step up right now. Lord, we, we can, we're never guaranteed another opportunity. You said today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't assume you can leave this room having had this incredible opportunity with this message that was so clear for you to say, I want to be a different man. I want to be a different woman. I want to step up. I want light to shine in my darkness. I want to become the person God intended me to be. So raise your hand right now if that's you. You're saying, I want to become a different man a different woman. I want, to, I want to be different. I don't want to bow anymore to those demonic entities. You know, yesterday we made a film in Smartsville about my conversion where I was set free from demons, where I ripped necklaces off and there were actors and all kinds of stuff. And now I'm here as God would have in the next day in the, in the Rock of Roseville, you know, 50 years later from my conversion. But I made a decision that day that I said, Jesus, I don't know if you are who that man says you are. But if you are, come into my life and do for me what you did for him. And at that moment, I began to be choked by the necklaces, by the bondages in my life. Those things that I was worshiping were choking me. I prayed my first prayer, Jesus help me. And the necklaces were ripped off by my hands. But God had set me free today. Rip off right now. Rip off the bondages right now. Raise your hand if you have an area in your life. Guys, if you can't follow God in this room, you will never follow God outside this room. This is your best shot right now you may ever have in your life is this moment. Right now, if there's any area in your life you want to be set free from, this is it. This is your moment. Father, we lift our hands before you. You said lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. I'm not going to be angry that you provoked me to have to lift my hand, and I'm not going to be doubtful that somehow it means nothing. It means everything right now. You've heard the clear word of God that has convicted your heart, challenged your heart. Step up right now. Become the man, the woman you're called to be right now. You're not too young. You're not too old. There's nothing you've done that disqualifies you. You become right now that person, that Gideon. Right now, you stand up and be that mighty person God's called you to. Lift your hands right now around the room. Father, we ask for that in Jesus' name. Father, we want to pray uh, for the moms, Lord, especially in this room, Lord, that feel so inadequate, Lord. They feel like, God, so many times they don't have an answer for the situation that they're in, but God, you do. And Lord, I just pray for each mom here. Lord, you said you would give us wisdom for every situation that we come against, God, that you will give it liberally, liberally if we ask. And so, God, I'm just asking today, God, that you would give each mom wisdom, Lord, as they raise their babies to serve you, as they, as they cultivate your relationship in their heart, God. Lord, we know it starts there first. It starts with a relationship in their heart, Lord, before they can pass it on to their children. And so, God, I just ask today, God, we take every day, Lord, as one day at a time. And I just ask, Lord, that your presence would be with each mom here. Lord, that they would experience, Lord, your presence. Lord, as they go into their homes, that they would cultivate peace and comfort, Lord, a place for their families to come into and feel at rest and feel a refuge from the world because we know our children, there's such an, an onslaught against our children in the world, Father, and they go out of the doors, Lord, and we have no idea what has been attached to them and how they see things and what has been bombarded. But God, they can come back into our homes, Lord, that we would create a house of prayer, a house, Lord, of understanding, a house of comfort, a house of peace where they can come in, Lord, and there'd be a shelter for them, Jesus, to come into. So, Lord, I pray a blessing over each mom here in Jesus' name. So, Father, we commit all these things to you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for breakthrough. God, would you continue to set people free in Jesus' name.